Welcome back to our coverage of the Miami Book Fair. I'm Jeffrey Brown, and I'm joined now by Harold Kushner, the author of Nine Essential Things I've Learned About Life, and welcome to you. Thank you, Jeff. Is, is, is this a, a, a kind of summing up of many? You've been writing about these issues for a long time. It kind of is. I, you know, I write every book on the assumption it will be my last <laughs> because I'm not so arrogant as to assume I will have the inspiration for yeah. another book. But yeah. yeah, this is a looking back and it's really about aspects of religious life and public life that surprised me. Ideas I was taught or I absorbed when I was growing up that by the time I went out into the world, people had changed the rules on me. Changed the rules on you? Yeah. Huh. So is that what you, when you, what did you see when you, when you went to tackle this and you look back? What did you see, what stood out most? Well, for maybe one thing more than everything else is that I was raised in a religious atmosphere of command and obey. Yeah. To be religious is to ask what does God want of me to salute and do it. Mm -hmm. I went out and I found out that people weren't interested in that unless what I was advocating was an answer to a question they were asking. A lot of theology talks about things that people weren't interested in. And they don't feel they had to do it. So I, I had to listen to what people's concerns were. I had to find out where they were bleeding spiritually so I'd know where to put the Band-Aid. Is it, so is that how it started out for you, the writing part of it, I mean? Because it, you're, it's clearly part of your calling, your profession yes. as a rabbi. Uh, but most clergy don't write books, right? <laughs> I think they would if they could. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot easier to put your ideas in covers and let somebody else go out and preach them. But no, I, I feel very blessed to be able to write this book. I wrote my first book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, because I had to. It was just an inner need to share what my family and I had gone through. What, to, tell me more. I mean, what, what was the My need? wife and I had a, a child whom we loved desperately who was born with one of the world's rarest diseases. It's progeria, mm -hmm. the rapid aging syndrome. Mm -hmm. and despite everything we did for him and despite everything that medicine did for him, he died the day after his 14th birthday. And it challenged what I had been taught to believe about God, that when bad things happen, God has his reasons for doing it. In the long run, you'll find out why this was the right thing. I just rebelled against that. Yes. I cannot imagine any possible good that mm -hmm. will come of this. Mm -hmm. After the book came out, I've had people come up and say, now you understand why God needed to have your son die so you would write this book. I didn't want to argue with them, but if I believed that about God, I would quit my job, walk out of the synagogue, and never go back again. Yeah. I don't need to serve a God who tortures young children for some far off benefit. I came to the conclusion that God doesn't send the problem, God gives us the strength to deal with the problem. When CNN interviewed How did you me, come to that conclusion, though? I mean, what did it take? How long did it take? Uh, pretty soon, yeah. after we got the diagnosis of our son's illness, yeah. I just I wanted to believe in God, but I couldn't believe in a God who would do this to a child. Mm. And I tried to find out what our other alternatives are there. I read everything on the subject. There were a few writers who advocated a limited God, a God who is not all powerful. Mm -hmm. And part of that clicked with me. But what I chose to believe is a God who was awesomely powerful, but his power is not the power to control. It's the power to strengthen, the power to reassure, the power to enable, to give people the strength to cope with the unfair things that life deals to mm -hmm. them. And from that book, you kept writing. And What's, that led well, to a, that, well, but that led to a life of, uh, of exploring these kinds of issues, right? Oh yeah, once I found out that there's a wider audience for it, you know, the secret to writing a book and getting it published is to have previously written the bestseller. <laughs> so I found there was an audience there's a, there's for it. There's a welcome there, an openness, yes. right? Like, let's do the next one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, what, so tell me about this one, nine essential things I've learned about life. For example, my work as a pastor and as a student of the Bible led me to conclude that for 2,000 years, we have gotten the Bible wrong. We have misunderstood the story of the Garden of Eden. It is not the story of disobeying and being condemned to exile forever. Mm -hmm. The key is the name of the fruit. Remember the name of the fruit? It's not the fruit you're not supposed to eat. 
Yeah. It's the fruit of the knowledge of good and bad. The essence of being a human being is to know that some things are wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what makes people different from other creatures. And Genesis 3, it's not a biological account. It's not a true story. It's a true story at a different level. Mm -hmm. It's a story of what is it that separates human beings from other animals and makes our lives endlessly complicated. Sex is so natural for every other living creature on the world and a source of bottomless anguish for human beings. Earning a living, sustaining yourself, just go out and forage other animals, human beings, get a job, go to mm -hmm. work, be evaluated, all these things. Yeah. Life is much more complicated, much more rewarding, much more profound. It's a whole different level. If we did, it just occurs to me listening to you, if we didn't have those complications though, what would, what would life be without be understanding about relationships between uh, sexes and, and tragedies that happen to us? That well, is of the course. stuff of life. Huh? Uh, the difference is our lives have meaning. Yeah. I, I think this is, that plus the sense of something's being wrong mm -hmm. is what separates us from other animals. Our lives have meaning. The death of a human being, a young human being, a good human being is a tragedy. You can't say that the death of an animal is inconvenient. You, your, your favorite pet, the dog you love, dies. It's painful to you, but it's not a tragedy. The mm -hmm. death of a human being is a tragedy. What happened, you know, we're talking about very personal things that happened to you, that happened to any of the readers of these. And I'm thinking we're sitting at a moment in, in you know, my day job, I'm covering the national and international news. We're at a moment of uh, what happened in Paris, right? The yes. attacks of people who were afraid in many. So how do you translate the personal to the more global issues? Do you make the kind of connection of the things you're talking about? Sure, at both ends of the process. In terms of the victims, that they are victims of human evil. Nobody has the right to ask, why did God let some people die and other people live? This was just a matter of whom the perpetrators were able to reach. It's tragedy because these are people who deserve mm -hmm. to live. Mm -hmm. The more interesting question is the attackers. What is going on in the mind of a person who is so twisted that all he wants to do is destroy? Uh, this person, I think, has lost the essence of what it means to be a human being. This, you know, the Bible says there are certain ways you have to live to fulfill your latent humanity, mm -hmm. and one of them is not to harm each other. When people are so taken over by rage, when people feel that the world has treated them unfairly so they will be unfair to others, they leave their humanity behind. But it's also violence in the name of religion. That is the saddest part of all. Religion should never be used mm -hmm. as an endorser of that kind of violence. Religion is never a reason for hurting innocent people. Mm -hmm. And any, any religious spokesman worthy of the name should be prepared to denounce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what, do you, what do you tell people about, you know, I, was, I was watching the news the other day and they were tar talking about the new normal you know, that we live in. And it occurs to me, you're writing, you've been writing forever about the normal versus the tragedy. And our tragedy is part of the normal sea of our life. But is there such thing as normal, new normal, new normal? How do we, how do we think? How do you think about these things? Hey, I'm not sure what new normal means. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure tragedy is a necessary part of our lives. Death, illness, frustration are a necessary part of our lives. Our response to them is what gives them a flavor of tragic or just in passing. Mm -hmm. These things hurt because we care about people. We care about the people, we don't know their names, who died in those Paris locations. We care about people who are killed in automobile accidents and plane crashes because we share our humanity with them. Mm -hmm. And something is lost in our humanity where we skip over those stories and try to get to the sports pages. I just want to ask you in our last minute here, you started off by saying you, you write every book as though it's the last one. So what's the next one? <laughs> I will give you a theological answer, Jeff. God knows. God knows. <laughs> All right, end on theology. 
Why not? Huh? Right. Uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner is the author of Nine Essential Things I've Learned About Life. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Nice to talk.